views and opinions expressed in this production are those of the individual and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Shooters Nation or our sponsors. Information provided on this show is not a replacement for legal counsel or professional training. Listener and viewer discretion is advised. This is especially true on live shows. Welcome to the Shooters Nation podcast, the show created for you, the armed citizen. Join our hosts and subject matter experts as we talk about guns and gear, practical training and knowledge, Second Amendment issues, and the firearms culture. Be sure to join us after the show at ShootersNation.com and become part of the Shooters Nation. Everybody, welcome to the Shooters Nation podcast. What is the Shooters Nation? That's you. You are. That's right. You are the Shooters Nation. This is the only talk show on the internet that was designed specifically from the ground up for you, the everyday armed American citizen. If you like what you're hearing on the show, we hope that you'll support us. And how can you do that? Well, several ways. First, subscribe to us on whichever app or channel you use to listen to the podcast. Second, become a Patreon patron at patreon.com slash Shooters Nation. And third, share us with your friends. Last but not least, we hope that you'll connect with us after the show. The hub for all things Shooters Nation is ShootersNation.com. That's where you'll find links to all of our social media and the full catalog of our shows, complete with supplemental information. I'm your host, David Yancey, and with me tonight is my co-host, Mark Lancaster from Squared Away Customs, fresh from the hills of northern New Hampshire, right on the border, the border, the front lines of America and Canada. Those beady-eyed yep. Canadians. On the cusp of Vermont as well. Cusp of Vermont. You can't trust those people either. Within view of Maine. Yeah. Like so, the syrup from Vermont. The maple syrup yeah. is good, but nothing else about them is trustworthy. So, yep. Right. <laughs> Especially now that they're dropping all these mag laws and everything now. That's right. Uh, so frustrating. As yeah. being we're a, you know, a neighboring state, they dropped a 15-round uh, pistol, 10-round rifle mag restriction. And the law that they wrote says if you own them prior, you're grandfathered, but you can't buy new ones. What? That only is applicable to residents. Me being a non-resident, I'm not allowed in the state with a high cap mag, period. Oh, my gosh. So I was kidding. I was like just you know, ad-libbing about how untrustworthy those Vermontians are. And, yeah. and so no. here we and are. It's a Democratic governor. Yeah. No offense to, to Vermontians, you know. Sorry that your government's terrible. It's Vermonters. But Vermonters, yeah. Okay. Vermonters. Yeah, Vermonters. Sorry mm-hmm. about your government, Vermonters. Yeah, it's no kidding. It's yeah. ridiculous. Well, ridiculous. And you know, this is coming from a state that had zero gun laws prior. Yeah, no kidding, right? I mean, no permits, no nothing, no gun laws. Like, yeah, their only gun laws were suppressors for a while, and now those are okay. And no loaded, no loaded long guns in a truck, which was a fishing game violation. I thought Vermont was pretty case sera You know, live and let live. Yeah, not pretty so happy, go free, you know, whatever. You know, what they did it was it was really unfortunate for a lot of local shops. You know, I've got a uh, some shops that I am pretty friendly with. You know, it's like so every Glock 17 that they now have in stock, they can't sell with magazines. That's ridiculous. You That's know, ridiculous. so then they have these magazines that they need to get rid of, and then they have guns they need to either buy magazines for or sell without magazines at a lower cost. Can they trade those magazines with FFLs across state lines to, to resolve that problem? Yeah, or what? I mean, they can do it, but yeah. like who's got, you know, 10 round mags. Right. Yeah. In free states, they're not going to do that. So, wow, that's terrible. Man, that's lousy. Yeah. yeah. Well, all right. That's terrible. So you guys had a pretty adventurous weekend, it looks like. So awesome. Yeah, we had our, yeah. our annual guys weekend up at my cabin. So yeah, much. Yeah. Bunch of bunch of local buddies for the most part, with the exception of one. We had uh, one of your neighbors come all the way up from Tennessee. What is going on with that? What yeah. is going on with that? Yeah, we were we were somewhere. Where were we? The um, delegate from Tennessee. Yeah, was it NRA? Maybe MRA NRA. When we were hanging out with Dan McCalman and we were talking to him about our guys' weekend, you know, adventures from the prior year. Palmer eighty Dan and Palmer eighty Dan. Yeah, said, "Man, I'd love to do that." Right. <laughs> like, Buy a Famous ticket, last words, right? Yeah, buy a ticket, and he sure is, he sure did. And then he that's awesome. Like, 
he experienced the uh the northern mountains and and spent a couple of days with us and yeah they, they jet set it out of there early and flew him to the flew him to the airport for a sunday morning flight and that's awesome flight but yeah he was yeah i saw there. some hashtags flying around one of them was something about glock and he 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 insinuated that that was a pretty sketchy hashtag so yeah 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 that's yeah, yeah. a, a different story yeah all right yeah, well, that's that's cool. Very cool. There was there, there was definitely some some good times with that. Yeah, sure. uh, we had a we had a fantastic weekend here in Tennessee, mm. dealing with a lot of hurricane stuff. Not not like in Tennessee, the hurricane hasn't hurricane hasn't even made it to Florida yet. Like so, right. you know, as we record this, so yeah, you know, just you know, me and my company dealing with a lot of hurricane stuff. So that was fun. Two thumbs up for Hurricane Dorian. So yeah, yeah, like everything else in Florida, it's like heading down the highway with its blinker on, not, not going anywhere in a hurry. So <laughs> yeah, my God. Well, cool. So, uh, for our audience, um, this episode, uh, we're, we're kind of slowing down like a hurricane. We're gonna, mm-hmm. we're gonna catch up with each other here and, and, uh, with all you guys in the audience and, uh, man, August, August was a busy month. Um, started off with a lot of chaos, unfortunately, mm-hmm. a lot of chaos. And actually, now that I'm thinking about it, September hasn't been a quiet month either already. I mean, we'll talk about that in, in another episode. Um, I'm not sure what order we're going to release all these things in. You know, maybe some some time travel going on here the way that we do this. But, um, yeah, so in, in August, there were a lot of important things to talk about. But that also means that several things didn't get talked about either. So I guess that's what we're going to do this episode, right, Mark? Um, I guess first thing. Take care of some fun business. Um, in the month of August, was there any new gear for you? Did you pick up anything new and exciting that that we haven't talked about yet? I don't think so. Um, such a busy month for me. I, I really, so is July. I really haven't been much on the uh, shopping or playing with new toys or anything. Yeah. Really just been you know, kind of working my tail off. Um, I really, I can't think of any new gear. Yeah. Do you see anything come across the counter or through the through the store? You know, even in, in both worlds, Squirtle Customs or the other. Yeah. Um, kind of weird. I mean, there's been there's been some new stuff floating around, and there's been some new stuff hinted at even in the industry. But you know. Yeah, I mean the, the OZ9 Compact. Oh I yeah, mean, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. out now and starting to ship as of tomorrow. So that's pretty awesome. So. I'm sure you've heard of me, previous listeners, um, talk about the the Zevo Z9, which has always been more of like a, a 17 inch or 17 inch, uh, uh, like a Glock 17 sized pistol. Yep. And now, now the compact, so it's more of that 19 variety. Um, and they've also got a 19 grip module coming out for the 17. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, which is pretty awesome. Um, so that's- guys can have like a 19 long right right you can still carry which is nice yeah i mean that's kind of like everybody was kind of let down when glock came out with the the you know the the g45 and the 19x sure. they were kind of like hey glock what we really wanted was right. a 17 slide on a 19 frame and right. so polymer 80 was the first one to solve that right right battle yeah by introducing the pf 940 cl right which is uh 19 grip 17 length yeah Glock, uh, you know, P80 Glock frame. Yep. Um, and you know, now there's a, a few that are jumping on board with that. Yeah. Um, and now it was another, oh, Zev doing that with the. I did pick up something new. Okay. Um, I got a Nomad Defense frame. Did you? Okay, so yep. been, we've talked about these before. What What do you think yep. about it? I think it feels really nice. So yeah. I got them at uh, TriggerCon. Um, super nice guys. Felt really good in the hand. I mean, I'm a very very loyal 17 grip guy like yeah I just yeah. have a big paw on me so like a 19 when i slam a mag in the bottom i am pinching a finger every sure. time or i have to do the you know lift two fingers off the frame just to, <laughs> the dainty teacup mag yeah them. yeah exactly yeah. um so it's it's never really been my thing and it probably never will be my thing right but it does feel good it's very mnp ish no kidding so does it have the does it still have the glock grip angle or did they change it a little bit no nope. seems like it's changed a little bit okay um i'm i haven't put one together yet i've literally just held it in my hand okay um it is gen 4 which is a little bit unique because the secondary market is filled uh, the secondary market and you know the accessory market is filled with gen 3 products right yeah this is kind of a so good I'm a niche surprise they did that yeah 
Um, I think that probably their goal there was to go after the clientele that Polymer 80 hasn't already gotten. Right. Because all Polymer 80 frames are, are Gen 3. Yeah, I mean, I really so, thought about doing that for a while, um, you know, because I had the the Gen 4 uh, slide orphaned when I built the, uh, you know, Space Glock, you know, my, my stupid name for my, you know, tricked out gun. And um, I still have that slide lingering around. So if you guys start cranking out holsters for the, the Nomad. Yeah, uh, I mean, we I had a little a bit of talk about their numbers. And I think that um, the, it, that's one of the ones, you know, we have to get like a, a, a CAD design, CNC yeah. machine, milled mold. Those things are just so damn expensive. Sure. We're really going to need a big calling before we can afford to do that gotcha. and make it justified, you know. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, I mean, hopefully they, they get the traction they need in order to make that happen because, yeah. like I said, it does feel cool. Um, it's got a little bit more of a beaver tail on it. Like I said, it's just a very, very uh, M&P-ish feeling. Yeah, yeah. The way it's palm swells and backstrap is. And it's so, adjustable backstraps too. It comes with three. Is anybody selling them other than Rainier Arms at this point, or is it just Rainier? Not that I know of. Okay. Not okay. that I know of. Yeah, and I think maybe that's hurting their distribution at this point. I mean, not that Rainier's a bad company to deal with. I love Rainier. Those guys are phenomenal mm -hmm. to deal with. Yep. Super, super awesome yep, guys. They are. I mean, they are like all in for the gun industry. And and, and yep. when I talk about like the gun, I'm talking about the cute the community, right? But mm -hmm. um, you know, people like options. So if they can't buy one from Brownells or Midway or their favorite, you know, whatever store. Sometimes there's, you know, they're lazy. They're not going to go click over to Rainier Arms for whatever reason. So, and that's a poor excuse not to go buy one. But people are, you know, they can be lazy. I can be lazy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, anyway, yeah. Okay. Well, no, that's cool. Yeah. I'm glad that you finally got one of those. That, that, that's neat. Yeah. You're the first person I personally know that has one. So, awesome. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. I hope you um, put it together and I want to hear how it runs. Well, the thing, the, the challenge for me is, I don't have anything Gen 4. Okay. Nothing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> everything I have is Gen 5 or hmm. 3. Yeah. I don't have nothing Gen 4 anymore. Yeah, if only you knew a guy that had a Gen 4 slide. To, yeah, send one I to you. I used to have Gen 4 stuff. Yeah. But yeah. That's was, all my agency guns were Gen 4s. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing how it runs. You know, we could either send that, 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 that frame down here or I'll send a slide up to you. <laughs> one or two, you know, a little, little something goes on. A little we'll bit. share a gun. We'll share a thing. thing. Oh, yeah, that's right. Little, little, <laughs> little uh, you know, what is it? Uh, oh, yeah, joint custody or something. Yeah, yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah it's a uh, man, I, I man. Unlike you, it was kind of a busy month for me in in August as I think about the stuff that I I did. Um, so you know that I picked up the five hundred nine, the FN five hundred nine MRD, mm -hmm. because you. You obtained that for me, and and I, and I tried talking you out of it too. You tried talking me out of that, <laughs> yeah. But uh, that was a happy day when I when I got a picture from you on my phone of that MRD sitting on your desk, and um, that's a that's a great pistol. Uh, I, I really have enjoyed it. So it's laying here on my desk in front of me right now, and um, I've had fun with it. So you know, much like the 509M, you know, it's 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 wonderful. Just you know, milled for the for an optic, and I've I've really liked it. And strangely enough. This one, for some reason, for me, unlike some other guns where I, I want the larger backstrap, it works best with a flat backstrap. Can't explain mm -hmm. it. Can't explain it. So, um, and then, of course, I dropped the, uh, I, I tried to, I resisted for about two weeks. I didn't monkey with the trigger, but I did go ahead and put an Apex flat trigger and the, the action enhancement kit in it just because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it's, it's undeniably better than what comes in at factory what comes in at factory is not terrible but this makes it pretty pretty nice and crisp so um yeah that um i don't know miscellaneous weird stuff i picked up a, a glock store dual purpose channel liner tool seems like a really purpose driven piece of hardware but I had a need to replace the channel channel liner in one of my the, the, the polished uh, steel one yeah yeah, yeah, I have it. yeah, yeah. Just a little, you know, it's got a screw, screw, you know, threaded screw end on one end to, you know, you thread it in and you yank the channel liner out of the striker channel, and then the other end's kind of, you know, polished and like you said, it's kind of tapped the the channel liner into the striker panel. So it's a yeah. very forgotten, overlooked part. That yeah, until you need it. Yeah, it's yeah. where. Yeah, I mean it is right. Um, yeah, you know, and yeah, 
I boogered one up, uh, apparently, and, and I hadn't realized that I had until I, I noticed that the striker was kind of dragging. And you know, I looked down through there. I was like, wow, it's kind of gouged up over time. It was on my Gen 3 gun. And uh, you know, I was like, well, I got How else it happens here. pretty commonly is people have their slides seracoded. Mm -hmm. And it's not removed from either the person applying the seracote or if you're prepping your gun, which I always do, I always strip my gun and send them bare. Yeah. Uh, if you don't remove that part and then you send it down, they assume that it's out, then they seracote it oh, and it's like the that that bothers it, but it's the baking process. Yeah, yeah. It's so hot that it changes the heat and will often deform the shape of the channel liner. I can see that. You're getting a light primer strike, you get all sorts of funky malfunctions get caused because that channel liner was in there. It was heated, sprayed, and then, you know, or, or sprayed, then heated, and then misshaped. Oh, yeah. It's up causing problems. I mean, it's just time. a, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's not a flimsy piece of plastic, but it's a piece of plastic. So, so yeah, it's, it's a 30 cent piece of plastic. Yep, you yeah. Know what I mean, it's a very, yeah, it very simple little thing. We're in your world if it starts to drag on your striker or your striker. Right. And, and then if you don't have that stupid tool, I mean, you're ruining it putting them in. Yeah. If you're not doing it with that tool, you're doing it wrong. Absolutely. Really one way to do it. Yeah. And it's hard to get them out without it, too. And, and, and so if you get them out without it, then you're ruining it that way, too. Right. Exactly right. One of those things I have a handful of always. Yep. You yep. Take them out. I always just put a fresh one in. Yep. Yep. I, uh, you know, Amazon Prime next day, wonderful thing, you know, 20 bucks, 25 bucks, something like that. So yep. um, it's one of those things I was like, man, why do I not have one of these? And nobody, I, nobody that I ask that, that I know, you know, all have Glocks and shoot Glocks. Nobody had one. And, mm -hmm. you know, everybody was like, hey, man, if you buy it, I'll remember that you've got it because I'll need this sooner or later. I'm like, yeah, I bet you will. You know, there's gonna be a $5 rental fee when you come, you know, joking. Yeah. But yeah. Um, what do you think? Uh, also, I did finally pick up the Hollow Sun 508T Red Dot, the HE 508T yeah. Red Dot. Yeah. Mark, that thing, I'm probably not going to buy another Trigicon RMR. I mean, it is it is that good. It is. Is it better or as good? It's it's probably better. It's as good for sure. What's What's better? So it is so two hundred dollars cheaper right off mm -hmm. the bat. Construction quality, it, it's it feels lighter in my hand. I'd have to I'd have to really put them on a scale and weigh them and mm -hmm. see. I, I think it's lighter. So the the solar, the dual power is nice. You know, the the longer battery life, that's nice. The reticle, I think for me, that that's that's sort of a game changer. And and why I think that that's a game changer for me is for the audience. If you've ever seen an EOTech, the old EOTech, like the you know the op mods and things like that, where you can have a ring around a dot, um, the HE 508T and and I guess the 507s are the same way. You can you can have you have a choice. You can either have the ring, you can have mm -hmm. a ring around a dot, or you can have the dot only. And the dot on this is a 2.5 minute angle dot, so it's it's smaller than the smallest RMR that I've seen yet. But when you put when you go with the combination with the ring and the dot, it is really quick to 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 you know when you when you raise up on target, if if you're within what I would think of as being kind of like you know conversation distance, you know say anything from seven yards in on a on a man sized target like a B twenty one target or you know a person in a self defense shooting, you know if you can get that in center mass and and you know you get the the ring in there go ahead and start pulling the trigger right i mean it, it's very quick now granted you know you can get the dot uh, um you know the the tiny dot in that same location do the same thing right sure but i think that it's just it's it's probably just more of a of a quick assertion of of you know am i there you know can your brain process it quicker and and, and you know, it's just that um but the other thing kind of that like the, kind of like the owl ear, sorry to interrupt. No, it is. It's very much. Yes. Of, of the Trigicon. Yes, exactly that. And I knew, I, you know, as soon as you said owl ears, I, I knew exactly what you were, you're going for. And you're exactly yeah. right. Um, also compared to the RMR uh, and, and, you know, I, we'll talk about why, but it, like the RMR um, or compared to the RMR, it has a bigger window of glass. You know, yeah. Like the yeah. SRO. Right. So um, with the with the Glock, with its um, I think our friend Jordan was the one that kind of keyed me in on this. Um, with the Glock's grip angle being what it is, 
with a with an RMR, I need to make sure that I'm bringing that that Glock up almost to normal iron sight, um, you know, sighting plane to make sure that I'm getting you know the dot visible. Now I'm not I'm not I'm not using the iron sights as a crutch, but that's that's really where the dot starts to become you know visible to me as I'm lining up on the target. And with this, because the window is so much larger. I can the dot becomes more visible to me on the target sooner as as the gun comes up and with the SRO the same way I mean, the Trigicon SRO same way um, and and obviously that's because neither the the Hollow Sun or the SRO were designed for the same crush resistance that the RMR was the RMR has those owl ears like you call them sure. for crush resistance for the military specifications right the crush mm -hmm. the owl ears are for you know, they're sacrificial to keep the, the thing from being crushed in a, mm -hmm. in a crush test. So that's why the SRO and the, and the hollow sun can have bigger, bigger windows of glass. Um, so that, that's, that's another advantage. And, and the, the, the final thing too, was just the warranty on these things. It's got a 10 year warranty on the body and a five year warranty on the electronics. And I think Trigicon, um, it's like five year and three year, five year on the body, three year on the electronics. So, um, if Hollow Sun stays in business and if they don't give you any crap about the warranty, those two things alone are you know, pretty good. Um, Aaron Cowan over at Sage Dynamics has beaten the absolute hell out of a 507 T you know, C. And mm -hmm. he said that um, in pecking order on his list, he recommends the RMR and then the Hollow Sun. And he mm -hmm. just got a 508 and I expect him to beat the crap out of it too and tell us how it, how it runs. Yeah, I mean, so that's the one caveat that i have to it yeah is that in the first drop test of the 507c he did break the glass did he really okay yeah yeah but what he's saying is that and he's still using it sure with the broken glass it's right. usable broken it's cracked but it still fires mm -hmm. it's still still maintaining zero so on and so forth but i feel like he got a lucky crack you know yeah. what i mean yeah. like oh he didn't crack it could be a crack that's in a location that sure. makes it distort the dot so right. on and so forth something along those lines um so yeah i look i mean you know i have hollow suns i have aim points i have trigicons you know yeah. what i mean i i have all of them i'm not i'm not naysaying the product whatsoever just skeptical on a yeah. edc sure so I, I don't know we'll see i'm, I'm gonna see how it runs i'm i'm not i'm definitely not gonna take my rmrs and sell them i've got three of the things so anyway Yep. Um, last thing that I picked up, and we'll talk about this more in a minute, um, which is kind of maybe a startling announcement, is I picked up a packed KCT Shooting Products Club Timer 3 shooting timer. So we'll talk about that in a minute. So, hey, on we'll shift gears out of that one real fast. Um, Glock Armorers class. You you went to yes. one. Let's talk about yes. that. I saw that uh, our, our <laughs> he's not he's not my friend i don't know him i, I feel like i know him just because he's a hilarious guy and i follow him on facebook but um bo over at uh ally gave yeah. you some crap he said what you had to go to a class to learn how to knock out two pins so yeah exactly yeah um i laughed Freaking right. joker. yeah so tell us about the armors class i mean it was um and then like in a, a few co further comments down there was harrison from you know another good gun dude and he's from omaha outdoors oh yeah and harrison's like did you actually learn anything and i sat there i was getting tires i think a tire <laughs> something, and i sat there for a solid five minutes and i'm like i honestly can't think of a thing that i learned right right but i, I kind of and let me preface this by saying like you know, going into this course, I could take a Glock completely assembled, strip it down to every remov removable part removed or taken apart with the uh, exception of the yeah. and put it back together in under three minutes. Right. You know what I mean? I've done this hundreds of times. This is like a, a pet peeve of mine. When I clean my Glocks, I tear them down every single piece and I clean every single piece. You like know do what you, I mean? Do you take it all the way down to the, 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 the frame, the slot, you know, the frame release, the lock lever, you know, the ones with the lid spring did everything. in everything really? Yeah. Good every piece. single piece I, I, yeah. that piece i don't take out i showed my five-year-old daughter how to like completely disassemble one the other day and let her do it she she got it mm -hmm. yeah she had fun and uh so you know to say that i'm proficient would be an understatement you know what i mean so i went into the class looking for the certification not the knowledge sure yeah and it was good i mean i guess i i guess i learned a couple things maybe about the history okay 
Um, maybe that sort of thing. Um, maybe why they do what they do, not necessarily how and how it, how it works. Right. Um, but, um, but I'm still super glad that I took the course. How long uh, was the class? It was eight hours. Okay. That's a lot of, that's a lot of Glock, eight hours of yeah. Glock. Yeah. Well, that's the thing is like they have the advanced armorers course. Oh boy. Which is, I think a three day. Yeah. A 24 hour. I don't even, yeah. what can you I'm possibly? Myself, like what in the flipping hell can you possibly <laughs> be teaching me for <laughs> right. three days here? We're going like, to learn how to make our own tenor for kids. Right. Possibly yeah. be doing, you know, Wow. Um, it's kind of intriguing, Yeah, but I don't think I would do it. Uh, um, just the standard search good for me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it was it was still a good experience. They put on a very good class, a very detail oriented class. They give you swag. They give you all kinds of cool stuff. Um, you know, a nice armors mat, a little uh, little rubber Glock tool uh, parts tray. Oh, look at that! Yeah. Um, um, and then they give you a full book, like spiral bound book, on every Glock model and gen made and parts part numbers and so on and so forth very parts, cool brick lists all that sort of stuff so in taking this class does it give you access to order parts from glock for repair that maybe the average layman cannot go order from glock? um i don't think so okay i don't think so um it just kind of gives me um an order form okay i guess yeah which you could probably achieve fairly easily um but yeah i don't think so okay so how, I, I guess, tell us a little bit about how, how did, how did you, how did you come into being able to take the class? And, you know, um, let's approach yes, it from the perspective of like, yes, Joe, Joe nobody part. knows nothing about this. So one of the tricky parts is you need to be either industry, law enforcement, military, or a Glock shooting sports foundation member in okay. order to be qualified to take the class. Okay. So. I am the vice president of the local gun range okay. and I hosted the class. So I had, you know, our local gun range be the host. The class is going to be held with us and so on and so forth. And Glock came to us. Okay. Um, that was kind of my foot in the door, so to say. I mean, I could have easily claimed industry and been able to achieve the same thing. But um, if you are not working in the firearms industry as a Glock dealer, um, or if you're not law enforcement or, or current law enforcement or active military, then, then they basically get people a hard no. Huh. Uh, so then the only other way you can do it is by joining GSSF, which okay. I think is 45 bucks for three years or something super reasonable, right. but just one more thing you need to do. So it ends up being like, I think a $295 for you to take the class because it's 250 for the armors course plus the GSSF, um, uh, membership. So, um, I set it up, um, and they put it on their website and I, you know, had a whole bunch of local people and friends and stuff be like, yeah, I definitely want to take it. And after about two and a half months, only four people had signed up. And if Glock doesn't get a minimum of 20, they will cancel. Wow. Between 20 and 25, they reserve the right to cancel. Okay. And then after 25 was kind of guarantees the slot, but they can't have any more than 30. All right. And then, so we got to like a week before and there was only like 18. I mean, it took a long time to fill this class up. And then the last few days, like 10 or 11 signed up. So we ended up filling the class. Um, it ended up being three civilians, um, but a one civilian, two or three industry and the rest were all local law enforcement that came from, we had law enforcement from Massachusetts, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, um, all came to us in central New Hampshire. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. So, I mean, it's, it's definitely, you know, a police department that, or, or any other law enforcement agency that, that runs Glocks for their officers that doesn't already have an armor on staff really ought to avail themselves of a class like this. Yeah, a lot of them, I think there was probably six or eight that were research because the cert's only good for three or four years, three okay. years, I think 2022 mine's good till. Um, so you get a few of them are research, but they take it. I was surprised they took it really seriously. One of the officers was involved in a, a serious felony the night prior 
he did night shifts and he was supposed to get out of work at midnight. Didn't get out of work, ended up getting out of work until 6.30 a.m. And the class was at eight. So he was basically up all night, then came directly to the class. And then something about this like felony situation that he had in this in this case, he had to skip out of the class for, and take a phone call and handle some business. Oh, wow. He was gone for about 45 minutes. He came back in the class and the instructor was like, sorry, you've missed too much. Oh, wow. Said no on his way. I was like, geez. Wow. He's not joking around. The, the guy was a little pissed. Like, honestly, can't say that I blame him, but Glock was not. And he's like, sorry, you've missed too much. That's crazy. That is crazy. Yeah, sorry about that. I had a I had a felony stop last night and some business I had to handle. He's like, Well, I apologize, and I'm sure your agency will understand. That's that's <laughs> hardcore. Yeah. 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 Wow. All right. Well. But yeah, lot. super good class. It was taught really well. The instructor definitely knew his stuff. Yeah. Everybody got a Glock, uh, a Gen 3 frame, a Gen 4 frame, and a Gen 5. No kidding. To work with. Yeah. Um, they went over the differences, the details, why they do certain things. Um yeah, that was good. Very interesting. Yeah, I, I completely unrelated to this, but um, I discovered, and I think this is probably news to everybody, and I'm the last person to really, I guess, to like come to a personal understanding of this, but, um, you know, Glock's got a pretty generous warranty when it comes to frames. Like, you know, I knew that they would replace them if you crack them or if they break on their own or, you know, if you just wear them out or whatever. But, um, like, if you just, like, completely screw a frame up um, because, you know, you decided to take a wood burner to it and, you know, stipple it yourself or, mm. you know, whatever. Um, they just don't care. They'll, they'll warranty replace that for you for, I think the nominal fee of a hundred dollars. Yeah. I've had it. I, they did it for yeah. me before. Yeah. I mean, um, and that, that's interesting. Yeah. I've got, um, I've got one that is not, it's not ruined, but it doesn't, it's a long story. I told you about it and it, it's just, you know, it, it's a gen five frame and, and I, I had work done to it and, and the work was actually done really well. Um, but it just, to me, doesn't feel like a Glock anymore. And that's all I can describe it as. And we'll go into that in a minute when we talk about, you know, the other part of this, this episode and, you know, it's weird anyway. Um, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to take them up on it. And, and yeah, uh, they're probably, I don't know. I don't even think they're, I don't even think they care. I, they're, they may look at it and go, I, uh, whatever, just toss it in a pile. Or somebody may look at it and, and go, well, this is going home with me at the end of the shift. Who knows? Right. You know, um, anyway, yeah, there you go. Um, I feel like I should have confessed that and, and now I feel better about it and whatever. Um, was there anything from the from the class at all that stood out to you as far as like, well, this was handy to know, like any. Um, yeah, there was one assembly disassembly trick that was. I've I've kind of made my own way to do it and make it be efficient. Yeah, but that way was definitely easier. OK. Um. And it's maybe hard for you to follow if you're not really versed in, in Glock parts and the way that the assembly goes and stuff. But when you take out the striker and the, the essentially the firing pin, it's kind of got that little dog leg that sticks off the side of it. Sure. And in order to take the, they're called the spring couplers. Yes. The spring down. It's got those two couplers that wrap around the firing pin. Yep. And I've always pulled the spring down, pinched really hard, and then pulled the striker up and then removed the couplers and then slowly released the tension. Yeah. But if you take it out of the slide, put the slide on its muzzle. Yes. And then turn it around backwards and put the channel liner side in and turn it 90 degrees so that dog leg doesn't fall into the slot that it's intended to go yes. in. Yeah. You pull it down without having to pull the striker back up to get those couplers off. So I did something similar with my Gen 5 not too long ago because... Well, or was it with my Gen 5? It was Gen 3. I think it was when I was putting my Gen 3 back together with parts. And I, I did use the slide to put that together because Glock, in, in, their, in, their, in their wisdom, they, they pretty much made their guns where you almost need no tools to, to put it together. It's actually one tool. Right, yeah. one tool, the, the takedown pin punch. And mm -hmm. I thought, surely something on this gun is made to make this job easier of, of using the, you know, of removing the, the striker spring cups is what I've always kind of called them. And I looked at the, at the 
the channel where the striker goes. And I thought if I turn this, like you said, if I rotate the striker so that leg sticks out to the side instead of going down in through the channel, I can use the slide as my fixture to, to press the whole thing, thing down like you're doing there, exactly like you're doing. That's what yep. I did. Yeah, exactly that. Yep, and it worked. Yep, it sure did. That, yeah, was, that was that yeah. was one of the the, the the few tips that I learned. That is that pretty I neat. Was, oh, yeah, well, that's pretty neat. Yeah, that's pretty neat. And I, I managed to do that without launching the thing into the ceiling because I thought that's what's going to happen if I if I lose my grip on this, something's going to embed in the ceiling of my of my room or you know whatever. But yeah, the, yeah. I mean, I, you got to give them credit. Block has has thought through a lot of stuff on this gun and um that's part of the beauty of it really in my opinion mm -hmm. is is you know when whenever i whenever i take apart another gun and i look at you know how the sear is designed or whatever else i just think to myself the glock sear has like what you know i don't know a handful of parts not very many the the gen 5 has that's one of the things i think the gen 5 feels different for me to me because of is the way that they've redesigned um the sear i think that it i can feel the difference maybe i'm imagining it but i, I feel like i can feel the difference in the the way that they redesigned it but you know still it's it's fairly simple um yeah i don't know glock uh glock simplicity i think that's really kind of where the the whole perfection thing comes in is it's just talking about the simplicity of their design so I don't know. We've gotten a lot of crap for to being Glock fanboys, but man, I, I love elegant design. It's it was really brilliant. Yeah. Um, and the fact that they've managed to keep it damn close to the same all these years yeah. and it's still cutting yeah. edge. You know what I mean? It's still yeah. very Yeah. Um another cool thing that happened there is I got these. Um, I can't tell what those are on the camera. What 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 am I looking at there? Those are what are those? These are backplates. Those are backplates that are half height, which will allow you to yep. remove the slide without. Nope. It no. allows you to see the the action of the, the, the trigger bar moving. coming off yeah, of the, your, your um, plate on your on your um, firing pin. Yeah. And make sure that you have enough contact, and you can actually see the trigger break inside. So ghost the the company that makes triggers and strikers and other things like that they make a similar design that's a mm. half height and it's clear and um they kind of for the same thing except they have a they have a uh, a connector that you file to fit and mm. um i think <laughs> i know this because I, I i did one once and i filed a little too much and the thing was like a hair trigger and i, I took it to the range and you know raised up Put it on target and before i even realized i popped a shot off i was like well okay that's it and i took that guy put it back in the in the range back i said that one's going back i put the factory disconnector or you know back in it but uh or the connector back in it but you know the same deal so you could you know you could see in there and watch as you were you know test fitting it to see how it was functioning that is really that's pretty slick i didn't know that glock had those that's, that's a pretty tricky little thing there you know um yeah you know i again going back to yeah, you know, just rampant fanboyism. Um, since we're going to be accused of it anyway, before we got on on the the you know to record the pre show conversation, we were talking about how I narrowly avoided going full bore stupid and buying an STI staccato P this past weekend. And um, who knows? By the time the audience hears this, I may revert. I may reverse course and go stupid anyway. I don't think it's going to happen. I really don't. I think I've corrected myself. It's a sexy gun. It's a sexy gun. I don't think it's going to happen. I don't. I really I don't. I think you should, I think you should, you know, really weigh the pros and cons in a nice, <laughs> fancy, color-coordinated. You're going to do it. You're going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. My wife's going to hear this, and I'm not going to hear the end of it. it. Right. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, it'll be a nice, multicolored graph. <laughs> spreadsheet pros and cons of this um <laughs> is, 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 is along came polly oh my god when he was a, a risk analyst and he yes those and the cons of everything yes. yeah yeah that's my life um so i nearly did it <laughs> and i talked myself out of it because as 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 a community i feel like we as shooters 
somewhere in like 2010, 2011, we turned the corner and we realized that 1911s don't make sense, right? Even though now in 2019, they're, they're cool and they're sexy again and they've got ion bond and, and, you know, black nitride finishes and, and, you know, they don't look like our father's 1911s anymore. You know, they're 2011s, they're high capacity, they're milled for optics. You know, they got 17 rounds, 20 round mags. The U.S. Marshal Service is adopting them. There's all sorts of reasons, but I talk myself out of it because it's still at its heart a 1911, and they're and they're they're finicky so high ma- hammer. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, but they're finicky high maintenance girlfriends that you know are going to be bitchy sooner or later, and they're going to refuse to function when a Glock has so fewer parts, and you can take it apart in like you know mere seconds. So. What is that? That's a tiny little gun. Is that a 42 or 43? What do you got there? That's, that's, that's like smaller than your hand. It's the noisy cricket. It's a 43, isn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> is that your wife's? It is. Yeah. That thing is smaller than your Yeti palm there. Yeah. Like all my thumb literally disappeared. My standard firing grip, you can see my thumb goes past the muzzle. Yeah, it's like going to be like a toasty thumb muzzle flash. That's why I don't do little guns. Right. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, but again, thinking about the simplicity of the Glock and how few parts it is and how quickly you can take them apart. 1911s, I swore them off for the most part because, I mean, I still got them. I just don't carry them because they eventually they don't, they don't run. They just, they're, it's, you know, they, it, yeah, the same reason I don't drive a freaking, I've got, I've got a 1968 Oldsmobile Cutlass. I don't drive it because it's, it's high maintenance, you know, it's, mm-hmm. Anyway, I'm sorry, you know, and maybe I've, I've spent a lot of time taking apart 1911s and putting them back together and cleaning them and obsessing over them. And I've had a lot of really nice ones. Sure. And I really wanted to, you know, there's, there's, a, they have their special place for me and that's, uh, in a safe, you yeah. know what I mean? I, I think that, uh, cool gun, but it's oh, still I mean, they're beautiful. They ain't anything ass to put together. They are. They're beautiful. They're elegant. I mean, it, it's, you know, it's the old Ben Kenobi. It's an elegant weapon for a more civilized time. It, it, it's a beautiful gun. But when a guy like Hilton Yam of 10-8 Performance, who, you know, he ran them. He was, you know, he's a pistol smith for a large metropolitan SWAT team. You know, it was his job to keep these things running. When he goes on record of saying, hey, look, you know, unless, you're, unless your department is willing to invest the time and the energy and the resources to keep these things in top shape and run them right and train people to run them right and maintain them. Don't do it. You know, Glocks, m and better choice. And I, I'm, I'm going to listen to that. And yet you've got very popular YouTube podcast, whatever media personalities have gone full circle and they're adopting these right now. And I can't help but feel like it's because, people are sticking them in their hands saying, Hey, this is an awesome gun. Go take it and talk about it. And yeah, it's a beautiful gun. And I'm sure it does knock the center out of a bullseye at 50 yards, but I've got a rifle for that, you know? Mm-hmm. And anyway, I digress. I came really close. I came so close to doing it. Like really close. Mark, my finger was on the buy now button. Like I almost, I was almost you have your credit card information entered. I had it entered. I, I was like, <laughs> I was even talking about the, like the donut pattern, like glazed donut powdered donut Kydex that I was going to order for, you know, Corey, like I need you to make this really ugly holster because that's the only way I'm going to feel good about carrying this gun. Like is to carry the most obnoxious holster possible. And yeah. So you already were shopping for accessories. Even. I was, I was already shopping for accessories. This was happening. This, this was how close it was to happening. I, I pulled up at the last minute. It was terrible. Yeah. I, I narrowly avoided it. So there you go. Uh, anything else about the Glock armors class that we ought to know? Um, Somehow I made this all about me. I feel like an ass. <laughs> no. Um, I just, you know, it gets back to him. Instructor Green did a great job. Yeah. And uh I would definitely recommend it to anybody, even if even if you know the system. Like I'm I'm by no means and I just hope it didn't come off that way that I sound like it was a waste of my time. Because it really wasn't. I was super glad that I took it. Um I will always keep my cert going. I'll take yeah. it again. My cert elapses. And uh it it was good. It was really well done and I definitely appreciated it. Well I think the key there with that people may have missed is 
If you're not law enforcement or military, a good way to get into that is to join GSSF. And there's other benefits there. And there's a bunch of other benefits. But there. a bunch of benefits there. I mean, not only you know can you go compete in GSSF matches, and and there are I've got friends that do this. And if depending on where your matches are, and and you know what days of the week you shoot, and and you know, who's there. Man, you have a good chance of winning a gun. Like, you know, I know guys that are not like stellar shooters and they go and they clean house on certain nights of the week or certain days of the month when like the really good shooters don't show up and they walk out there with a certificate for a new Glock. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty awesome, right? Yep. And then you get discounts for Glocks, I think two two certificates maybe a year or something like that or whatever. Yep. And you also get uh, accessories discounts, you get yeah. parts discounts, you get there's a bunch of discounts that you get with yeah, it. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. There's Cheap. definitely a lot of benefits. Just yep. definitely check out that website too. Even if you're not going to take a Glock class, it's it'd be something worth looking at. Definitely. Hey folks, David here. Did you know that there is more to the Shooters Nation than this podcast? Mark and I are working hard to knit together a community of well-informed, responsibly armed citizens who are well-prepared to face the worst days of their lives. We would like to invite you to join us and the other listeners on our various social media outlets and become an active part of the Shooters Nation community. You can find us on Instagram as at Shooters Nation Radio. And if Facebook is your thing, you can find us there at facebook.com slash Shooters Nation. While you're there, be sure to click on the link to join our Facebook Shooters Nation community. And as always, you can head over to ShootersNation.com for more listener resources. Um, so talk about something else here. Um, okay. Yeah, okay. So... This is uh, this is this is gonna be kind of fun, and and um, I didn't put this in the show notes intentionally. Um, so there's a big blank spot here, and, and I want you to I want you to give me hell, Mark, because I mean this is you know this is what friends are for, right? Um, is this about another Excel sheet? No, this is about another Excel sheet. Yeah, you get to <laughs> you get to you get to be the you know the proxy for the audience. Um, so some context is probably necessary for this. This is this is the part of the episode that I'm gonna. I'm going to title um, Old Dog, New Evolution, right? And um, the context part of this is no matter how I phrase this or word it, um, somewhere somebody is going to get it wrapped around the axle, <laughs> and that's probably what's fun about it. Um, they're going to mock it, and you know, it's just it, it, it's what it is, and I'm going to own it. I'm fine with that and, and whatever. Um, the Internet allows people to be jerks. From a distance so you know if that's you enjoy this segment <laughs> you'll live your best life i guess have fun with it at my expense whatever um so why all of this listeners may recall that um from our past episodes on church security and school security with william the retired navy seal um shortly after we recorded that um my family and i visited william's church here locally in, in the in middle tennessee and we actually started attending that church and we've been attending ever since then. So that's been about a year and a half. And um, it took about that long for me to decide that I wanted to actually volunteer and get involved in that, in the church safety team that, that William runs. And um, as I've come to really learn and appreciate about it, there's more to it than being an armed security presence. Um that's one aspect of it for sure. But, you know, for those of the people, for those people that qualify on the team, um, they can be armed. But, you know, the idea here is that William runs a pretty tight ship, very tight ship, as you would expect for a retired Navy SEAL who then, you know, went on to become an EOD master chief, you know, because playing with explosives and things like that is more exciting than being a Navy SEAL, I guess. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of crazy. Um, but so he expects, the, the people that are going to be armed on the safety team um, to be able to demonstrate competency and um, accuracy is required for that. <clears throat> so if you're going to be armed, he wants you to be accurate. And as a result, as a standard, yeah. as a standard, <clears throat> right. And as a, and as, a, as a result of that, we run a series of time drills uh, from concealment several times a year. And so for that, we, we run a, either a, an exact copy or a modification of Tennessee's armed guard um, requirements. And so they're done from various distances um, on a timer from concealment, from low ready, you know, et cetera. And 
know, the distances aren't all that great. They're actually, you know, pretty close to what I have always shot or what I shot back, you know, 15 years or so ago when I shot competitively. So, you know, but there's still something different about doing it when, you know, it, it counts. Like when everybody's watching you, when, you know, this really matters. It's not just me at the range, you know, dinking around with, you know, ammo and, and you know, gun on Saturday morning where if I pull a shot and, you know, I've got a flyer or whatever, you know, okay, well, don't worry about that little guy over there. No, we're really worried about that little guy, especially that little guy mm -hmm. went way far off. So thankfully, you know, knock on wood, historically, I've not been that terrible of a, of a shooter. But anyway, um, so here, here's kind of what I'm, I'm getting at, you know, especially with the disclaimer. You know, people are pretty quick to make jokes about mall cops and armed guards and rent-a-cops sure. and, you know, stuff. And I, I've always been kind of that guy, too. I've always, you know, thrown those jabs. And I think I'm, I'm probably opening myself up to some of that here. here. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, in a role like this, my wife and my kids are some of the people that are going to be in those hallways at church, along with literally hundreds of other people whenever, you know, we're, we're doing this stuff. And um, the difference for me, at least in my head, is that if I'm, if I'm out with my family at Walmart or something like that, and a guy starts shooting at people like the guy did at El Paso, Texas recently, my first obligation is to myself and my family, right? Um, I don't, I don't have an obligation to defend anyone else as callous as that may sound. Um, and you know, there may be listeners in the audience that may take umbrage with that right now. They may be like, Oh my God, I can't believe you said that. Right. You know, if you've got a gun and you're out there, you've got an obligation to do something. You know, actually I don't. Right. Yeah. You know, my first obligation and the first obligation of anybody on our, in our audience is, you know, are you there with your family? Are you there with your kids? You probably should take care of them first. Take care of yourself first. Mm -hmm. You know, if I can take my family and we can run like hell, I can choose to fight only if confronted, right? Right. Um, now, if if I can get them to safety or if that guy's like right in front of me and he's got his back to me and, and it's a sure thing, I'm probably going to I'm probably going to deal with that, right? But the expectations of me and anybody else I would think on a safety team at any church are different if we're being entrusted and I'm going to call it like as a civilian volunteer to stand between potential harm um, and a lot of families, right? So one of those expectations in, in a in a shooting scenario, I, I would think, is that if shooting has to be done, it's going to be done with a high level of proficiency and impeccable accuracy, right? So um, again, you know, if, if if you're dealing with a hallway in a building and the hallway is full of people. Um, and there's classrooms on either side, and those classrooms are full of people's kids or whatever. You know, if you miss, that miss is going to go somewhere. You know, and, and we talk about this a lot. You know, we've uh, you know past guests on the show have talked about um, you know every every bullet you shoot it goes somewhere, right? And and we've even anecdotally heard you know every every maybe not on this show, but we've had people talk about you know every bullet you you send down the barrel has has a lawyer attached to it. Yeah, you know. Um, so for me, I'm, I'm kind of giving myself zero tolerance for missing here, you know, in, in, in the training that I've done, which goes back to this whole idea of me buying a shot timer. Like the last time I had a shot timer was like, you know, the early two thousands. And I sold that when I got done competing and, and I, I quit competing when I got married, you know, when I got married, met my wife, we started dating, got married. All that went out the window. That was kind of like a single guy's hobby where I had lots of time on the weekends to go, you know, play with guns and run around with guns. And it was fun and, and you know, that kind of stuff. But, um, <laughs> you know, I got rid of it, um, got out of the thing. And now I'm, I'm finding myself really obsessing over minute details of shooting mechanics that I'd stopped thinking about for like 15 years. And it's weird. And, and you know, what's funny about this is that you can't talk about this stuff with a lot of people. You know, most people, their eyes roll back in the back of their heads and they're like, whatever. You know, I mean, I like to shoot. I like shooting things like guns. And, you know, it's like, hey, I, I do too. I really do. But I'm kind of like on this really weird, <coughs> pardon me, excess, obsessive quest right now to to be better at it. And and I'm proficient enough that I feel like, you know, again, knock on wood, that if I, if, you know, William were to ask me, hey, 
I want you to go qualify tomorrow. I could do it because the distances aren't, aren't great. It's like three and seven yards, right? So mm-hmm. nine feet, 21 feet from a draw, from a low ready. Can I put round center mass on a B21, you know, North Carolina B21 man sized target silhouette somewhere in the silhouette? Sure. That's not hard, right? You, right. Know, you, you or I could, you know, throw our gun and hit that, right? But I'm really looking at can I put them center mass, heart, and some of these shots also, the drills require a head shot. Can I do that consistently with the smallest group possible, you know, under pressure, under time in less than five seconds? And I'm pushing myself par time. Like, can I get it out of a holster from concealment under, a, under an untucked shirt, you know, and get that first shot in there at two seconds, right? And, you know, that's not fast. Competitive shooters do it faster than that. You know, I'm, mm-hmm. you know, so um, anyway, the, the weird things, like the first thing I focused on for me, and this is kind of where like the old dog, new evolution thing came in was grip for me. Um, like, the, <laughs> how, like, you know, dog, dogging on 1911s a minute ago was a little bit nostalgic because like when I shot competitively, I shot 1911s mostly. Um, and, and you know, it was USPSA provisional 1911 single stack hadn't really come in yet. They were they were still deciding. USPSA was t- still deciding on whether or not it was going to be a sanctioned division. So I think this was probably like, I don't know, 2005, 2006, if I were to guess, because I had to go back and look it up and figure out when they ac- actually made it a division. <clears throat> but a 1911 it kind of just fits your hand however it does, right? I mean, there's not a whole lot of variation in a grip on a 1911. You can you can adjust the the, the thickness of the grip panels, um, but that's it. And so it fits your hand how it does. And, you know, the mainspring housing, you can get a little bit of palm swell, you can go with, you know, flat or whatever, but that's it. And especially when you're talking about the the dimension of the trigger reach or the reach of pull. So like between the the heel of your palm where your thumb meets your hand and your trigger finger. And so I've got, I've got wide hands with short fingers, which is kind of unfortunate. It's kind of like the story of my, of my life. I'm, I'm wide and short. But um, I made do with a 1911. And, you know, I, what I ended up doing was with, with wide hands, short fingers, I could get my fingers around the gun, the grip, you know, pretty well. But it left me a lot of real estate on the side of the grip for my support hand to just really get in there, clamp down on that thing which is perfect for, for managing recoil. And I didn't realize that that's the way that that worked. It just worked for me, happenstance. Mm-hmm. Um, but so I, I stumbled across a magazine article. Um, I think this magazine article was, I don't know, 2015. I, I'd have to go back and dig up the article. Um, I, I did poor research here. But um, Rob Latham and Brian Enos. So everybody, I, I think Rob's you know, name is very, you know, everybody knows Rob, right? You know, Springfield mm-hmm. shooter, um, you know, Springfield Armory sponsored shooter. But Brian Enos, maybe not as well known unless you're a competitive shooter. But these dudes, if you really go back and look at it, they are probably the originators of the thumbs straightforward method of gripping a gun that most of us have kind of come to, to know as being like the common, the, the modern combat grip, right? So, um, you know, if, if you've, if you grab a Glock or any other modern, you know, handgun and you, you grip it with thumbs straight forward down the side of the slide, you can thank those guys. And mm-hmm. this magazine article was talking about it. And, you know, um, Rob kind of, you know, was, you know, sort of starting that at, um, the early eighties at a steel challenge shooting match. And, and Brian started doing the same thing. Um, I think Rob was the first guy that said, Hey, I'm going to take my finger off the front of the trigger guard. And so that kind of like naturally evolved into, you got to do something with your thumbs. And Brian said, I'm going to do the same thing one night after like a really, you know, according to the magazine article, like after a really bad day of shooting, he said, I'm, I'm just going to try it. And, and he said, you know, just like all night long at the hotel, he's doing dry fire, dry fire, dry fire. And he even thought to himself, <clears throat> there's no way this is going to work. And the next day he went and shot like the best day, you know, best match he'd ever done. And they kind of like went from there. So on the 1911 with my short ass fingers, you know, (laughs) coming just far enough around the front strap to do the job and getting good pressure on the side of the grip with my support hand, you know, it's kind of working that way for me. And I didn't, you know, really know any of this crap. Um, 
And then I, I figured out I could do the same thing with a Gen 3 Glock 19 because that was like my first Glock, right, was a Gen 3 mm-hmm. 19. It had kind of that same fat grip, you know, and that same grip style worked for me. So you fast forward about five or six years, and we started getting all sorts of modularity with grip designs and handguns, right? So I had options. Like the 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 M&P came out and, and the XDs with, you know, you, you could get thin grips and you could, you know, change out the back straps and, yeah, then the VP9. Yeah, the, yeah, right. The VP9s and the the P2000s, the H and K P2000s. You could change out stuff, and now you could make it fit your hand. And I started doing that, right? I could make guns fit my weird hands, and so I did. And you know, then the Glocks. You know, the 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 Glocks came out with the SFs. You remember those, the small frames? Sure. Um, and and then you know the Glock Gen. The Gen 4s, you know, they came out with the smaller frames with, you know, the back straps and the Gen 5s. And, of course, the M&Ps. And the M&Ps have always kind of fit my hands better than the Glocks, which I started playing around with my my M&Ps this past weekend. It kind of reminded me why I liked them so much. But, um, you know, as I started having these options, it was funny. Like, I started, you know, making my frames smaller, thinking, hey, this is great. Like, you know, um, you know, I can suddenly get my whole hand wrapped around this thing. This must be better because that's what you do with a hammer. That's what you do with a broomstick. That's what you do with all these other things that you hold. So this must be the better way to do it. And then in the mix of that, you know, I don't know, you you tell me, I I began to hear things like in the community, you know, the firearms community, things like, you know, it's important that you be able to manipulate the magazine release without breaking your purchase on the handgun grip. Have you ever heard that from a trainer? I mean, you've got big hands. You you probably can just um, do that. Well, no, well, that's the thing. In a lot of guns, I can't because it's I have to pull back so far. Oh, really? I okay. Have to, I have to break it the, for the other reason. Cool. I, I, so, I mean, I, I wouldn't like, have thought. Yeah. Like this is. It's yeah. Awkward. On that little, on that tiny Glock, you are. Yeah, You're going to like retract your thumb. Yeah. I have to pull yeah. way, way far back. So I kind of almost have to. I still have to tip it in a different yeah. way. Just yeah. To, I've almost overshot it. Yeah. Like there, it'd be easier. Um, but, and then <laughs> on, depending on the gun, I mean, I still need to break my grip. Um, yeah. But I think it's a, I t- kind of turn it into the, the f- I use the flip kind of move. Right? right. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, I've always been kind of jealous of the guys with, with bigger, you know, hands, not because there's jokes that are be made about that. Right. Cause people have big hands, you know, what else are big. Right. But um, you know, Oops. Yeah, right. Yeah, gloves, feet. Um, you know, but you know, large longer thumbs, you can hit the mag release easier. And so, you know, I remember taking classes, different defensive handgun classes in the the like 2010 to 2015 time time period. And, you know, there was a lot of preaching done about you don't want to break your grip, you know, because you want to be able to represent that gun on target and not have to adjust your sights and find your sight picture again. You know, it needs to just be repeatable, blah, blah, blah. And and you feel a little, I felt a little inadequate. It's like, well, my thumb, I can't make it longer. So, um, you know, making the grip narrower or thinner or getting a extended mag release suddenly became like, oh, that's the thing I got to do. I got to compensate for this. So really it was more about making the grip thinner for me. And, and you know, smaller grip, unfortunately meant less surface area for my support hand to get on. And I wasn't, I wasn't paying attention to that as much as, as I thought I was. So, again, you know, if you've got, like, long hands or perfect hand anatomy or whatever, or if you're in gaming and competition, you know, if you study that stuff, you know, I guess, you know, whatever. But statistics about officer-involved shootings runs contrary to that, or civilian shootings even. Like, you realize that magazine reloads aren't happening, right? So why the hell are we worrying about extended mag releases and being able to dump a mag without repositioning your hand so much? You know, right. You know, the, like you said, you tilt the gun and, you know, I heard uh, our friend, um, you know, Francis Marion, you know, previous show guest, uh, he wants to be back on again, side note. Um, you know, he, he showed me a video today because we were chatting about this and the the trainer for a law enforcement agency referred to it as climbing the gun. When you tilt the gun slightly and t- you know, climb it to get mm-hmm. your hand on the, your, your thumb on the mag release, he said, you know, it's, it's perfectly normal to do that. And I so said, I do the exact same thing, you know. If, if you're doing a mag you know, change, that's far less likely, first of all, to occur in a shootout or a, a shooting. You know, what's more important is proper control and grip to mitigate recoil, right? Um, you know, so 
that that whole thing that I had allowed to become like, you know, a priority, yeah. you know, the grail, the holy grail was actually screwing up what should have been important, which is make the grip fit your hands so that you're running the gun most efficiently. Um, I was listening to Claude Warner, you know, the tactical professor, former Green Beret, talking on another show just this past week, another podcast. And coincidentally, he even said that reloads are statistically so rare, he has deprioritized them completely in a lot of his training classes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he's, he's teaching his students focus on the fundamentals of shooting, accuracy, um, follow through, you know, that the mechanics of good shooting. And then, you know, reloads are secondary yeah. because they're so rare. Right. But then again, you know, here we are, like for me, at least what I'd been hearing a lot was, you know, let's make sure we're, we're working our reloads into our training. And, and you know, that, that, yeah. you know, mag release manipulation was so important. <clears throat> so where this really stood out to me, and, and I guess what I wanted to talk about was that as I began to obsess over, you know, this, this stuff and, and, you know, doing my drills and trying to get, you know, kind of like, you know, prepare myself, knock the rust off. You know, can I get these alpha zone hits consistently under speed, under stress? Um, two weeks ago, I took my, my, my carry gun, my primary carry gun, my, my zevved out Glock 19 to the range. Um, and that's the one that's the gen five with the frame that I had worked over. Um, the guy did phenomenal work on the stippling and everything else. Um, I probably screwed that one up by, you know, kind of undercutting the trigger guard a little bit so I could get a higher grip up on it. Um, I'll own that. I made the mistake of doing that. And I altered the geometry of the grip, my grip, not its grip, but my grip on the gun. So it doesn't feel right to me. Um, but I took it to the range. And I did drills for like, man, I, I'm going to say five hours, right? I, I took 800 rounds of ammo and I burned every bit of it up. And <clears throat> when I left the range that day, my hands were raw. Like, like I had calluses from um, daily use of the rowing machine that were almost like torn off my hands, like yeah. off my support hand, off my shooting hand, both. And I had new calluses that were like coming up on, on my, on my, on my dominant hand, my shooting hand. And I thought, wow, that's a lot of shooting. You know, that, wow. And, and I didn't even think about it until a couple of days later when I thought, why do I have calluses? Why did, why did that happen? Like if I had a good firm grip on that gun, that wouldn't have really occurred. Right. And then it occurred to me what really, what that was telling me, what the gun was telling me, if I'd really listened to it was, David, you don't have a gun. You don't have a good grip on that gun. Like your casual shooting at the range for the past 15 years with this smaller grip felt good to you. And like you felt good because, hey, you got a good grip. Your hand wraps all the way around it. You can reach the, you know, your thumb and forefinger can touch each other when you wrap your hand around the grip. So therefore, it must fit your hand better. That was a lie because in actuality, I wasn't getting enough surface area on my, on my support hand to actually clamp it in. And it was moving in my hand, you know, the friction of the thing moving in my hand and the recoil was what was causing all that rubbing and, and abrasion to, to rub skin and, and, you know, tear my hands apart. Um, and, you know, I just wasn't listening to the gun and, you know, it kind of went back to Brian Enos, you know, interesting character. If you like, if you remember Brian Enos's forums, you know what I'm talking about. If you're not, you should go look and read some of his stuff. Um, the dude's out there, right? I mean, he's kind of like really quasi philosophical on a lot of his shooting stuff. But one of the things that he's kind of like he says in his books is listen to the gun. The gun will tell you what it needs. The gun kind of wants to do what the gun wants to do. It's up to you to let it do it. And it's like, whoa, that's trippy. But I kind of got what he was saying. After 800 rounds of the gun beating my hands up, like I was fighting it. If I just listened to it and, and, you know, paid attention to what it was doing, I would have realized, all right, dumbass, you need to put the bigger back strap on this gun. You need to get more hand on it and, and really get in there. Even though it's going to feel weird for a, you know, a couple cycles, you're going to realize, sure. <clears throat> you know, more hand on the gun, you know, more control over it, you know, less follow up, let the, let, you know, just ride the recoil and, and, you know, let it do its thing, but you're not going to be tearing your hand apart. And so that's it. Yeah, really that's, <laughs> for me, that's what I wanted to kind of get out there and walk through that for the for the listener is that, you know, challenge yourself, go to the range and spend some time and sacrifice the sacred cows, right? 
you know, the stuff that, that the industry, <laughs> and I'm going to, let me back up. I heard, I heard this said in another podcast. I think it's Craig Douglas was talking to, oh, who is he talking to? I don't know. Craig Douglas was on a podcast I was listening to the other day. And the word industry was thrown out there, <clears throat> pardon me, talking about the, the shooting you know, community. And he said, mm-hmm. I think community is a better term because in industries, you have standards. And in the training world, in firearms training, there's not a whole heck of a lot of standards. So maybe we ought to use community instead of industry. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there's been so many things thrown out there in the, in, in the training community, and some of them aren't good, that we really ought to challenge them periodically and ask ourselves, does it really work? And does it work for me? And, you know, lately, I've been going back through the fundamentals. You know, I've been watching a lot of stuff from Aaron Cowan. I've been watching a lot of stuff from Frank Proctor. You know, I've been, I'm, you know, sometimes those, you know, especially Aaron, he can be polarizing, right? We've talked about this, you know, yeah. very bright guy, very smart guy. I think his personality and, and, you know, mine and yours, you know, are so much alike that, you know, it'd go one of two ways. Either we'd love him and we'd get along famously, or we'd be like, man, we, we hate each other. Right. But, yeah. um, you know, very smart guy. And he brings the data, which I love. Um, but, you know, listening to these guys and the way they break down the minutia about mechanics and then they back it up has helped me over the past month to really sit there and think, huh, okay, I'm going to take that. I'm going to try it. But had I not forced myself to go to the point of failure with, with a gun that I'm, I'm actually pretty intimate with, I would have noticed this. I would have continued going along with a, you know, with a small grip thinking, hey, this works for me. And in reality, it doesn't, you know? Right. So that's what it's about. I've talked about it quite a few times about how uncomfortable it is to go outside of your comfort zone because nobody likes doing what they're not good at doing. Yeah. It doesn't feel right. Yeah. No, it may be a better thing or it could turn into something better. Yeah. But how good does it feel once you've figured it out? Yeah. And it's just like, oh, light bulb. That light bulb moment feels fantastic. You know what I mean? Like, man, I wish I had known this sooner. Man, I wish I had done that before. Completely wish wish I had done this sooner. I I'm playing with things now on that gun that I would have, I would have left alone. Um, a good friend of mine and I were talking about, he bought a, he bought a new truck. He bought a Ford Raptor and you know, he's excited about it and it, it's the perfect vehicle. And his wife asked him, so what are you going to do to it? You know, what are you going to do to it? And she knows him. You know, he and I have worked on cars for like as long as we've known each other. And she knows that historically neither one of us can leave well enough alone. Right. right. It's going to start with something, muffler, tires, lift, something. Right. He goes, I'm not going to do mm-hmm. anything to it. She's like, what do you mean? I'm not going to do anything to it. That's not, yeah, I don't believe you. He said, it's perfect the way it is. I'm not going to do anything to it. I've learned to leave well enough alone. And I said, yeah, you know, there comes a point in our, in our lives where we get a little bit smarter and we say, I'm not going to screw with it because once I start doing something, I'm going to, I'm going to upset the balance and I'm going to hate it and I'm going to get rid of it. He goes, yeah, exactly. And so, I'm to the point right now, I don't hate my Glock 19, but I've upset the balance and now I'm willing to start playing. Right. So I, I told you, I confessed like this is the first time ever that I put one of the back straps on. That's got a beaver tail. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. And like up to this point, the gen fours and the gen fives, I looked at the box, of the beaver tails. I'm like, Glocks don't have beaver tails. That's, that's sacrilege. That's an abomination. Toss them into the parts box. And I thought, hell, I don't know. I got, I've got nothing to lose. Right. I mean, right. All bets are off. You know, anything's possible at this point. I threw it on there and I started doing some dry fire with it. I haven't taken it to the range yet with the beaver tail on it, but I was like, hmm, this actually doesn't feel weird. This doesn't suck. I may take it to the range and see what happens because obviously there's a mechanical advantage of having a beaver tail on a gun. It it, it helps with recoil management. So yeah. I don't know. Um, I do have another frame showing up for that gun. I bought a, a unmolested bare bones gen 5 19 mos frame which is the the you know, it's not it's it's identical to the frame that it came with before i had it stippled but it doesn't have the little cutout on the front of the back strap where you know everybody complained about so yep. um that's that's arriving soon um and i'm gonna have that at least to play with i'm gonna see how it works i think i screwed the gun up when i undercut the trigger guard so i could get a higher grip on it i don't think that works for me i think the the wrist angle that that required for me is uncomfortable and I can't explain it. Maybe it's this carpal tunnel or whatever from a lot of it work, you know, cause Hey, that's what I do. I'm not a door kicker. I'm not high speed. So, um, but yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think that, um, 
you know, that it's kind of eye opening to me that, that, you know, something like that, because what, when you're talking about getting your palm on the grip panel yep, for your non-dominant hand, yep, I don't know what that's like. No, I mean, cause you got, you got big bits. My fingers wrap all the way around. So I'm gripping my other fingers. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I kind of, I kind of, I kind of pinch in between yeah. the first knuckle and the second knuckle. Right. I'm pinching my other hand. Right. And that's how I achieve. Well, so I'm going to make some noise here for the listeners, I and I, I want to clear this gun. I see exactly what you're saying, and let me let me see if I can show you this. And here's where it's uncomfortable for me. I think it would be uh, it would be more comfortable for me like you, but with me. So I've got the FN 509 MRD in my hands right now, and so I'm showing Mark this on the camera. You know, you can see that like I've got even with the flat back strap, this is the narrowest this circumference I can get on this. My fingers are kind of like right here. So when I when I get my support hand on here, I'm actually pinching right down on top of my fingernails, right? And that can become kind of painful after a while, especially if you apply sufficient force to control the the recoil of that gun. And so with a Glock or the MMP with a you know with a decent sized back strap on it, I'm really you know, my fingers. I'm just kind of like simulating it. My fingers are like really kind of like right here. I'm clamping down on top of those fingernails. And so, I mean, just imagine you know putting a lot of force down on top of your fingernails. <clears throat> It's sensitive. You know, I can, I can, you know, kind of sack up and man through it and, you know, whatever else you want to say. It's kind of, you know, pithy term to, you know, you know, grit through it. Um, but after a couple hundred rounds or so of just gripping, you know, a gun with enough, you know, forceful of a grip or firm enough grip to control it, it gets a little sore. And um, especially if you're, if you're just bearing down on top of any sort of stippling or texture, like especially that 509 has got some nice tread on it. Um, yeah, you start to feel that after a while. I think if my fingers wrapped around even further, it might not hurt so bad. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, um, we're all different, you know, we're all, we're all made a little different. Our, our hands and fingers and stuff are not all the same size. So, uh, challenge the sacred cows, you know, play, play with the guns. You know, if your guns come with different back straps or, you know, whatever, play with them, see, see what fits. I think, you know, see what it says to you, try it out, you know, um, just because you've got a small hand doesn't mean that the small grip may work. You know, the, the large grip may surprise you. They, they may put your finger right where it needs to be on the trigger. And that may be what matters. So, and, and I think that the old, the old saying, if it's not broke, don't fix it. You yeah. know, I don't necessarily think applies because, you know, I learn things to this day that I'm just like, this is making me better. Yeah. Yeah. These make me better. Like I didn't think it's like, there was a time I kind of scoffed at a comp on a nine. Like, yeah, if you can't handle yeah. the recoil of a nine, then what are you doing? Right. And then it was like Aaron Cowan put it very, you know, very cleanly. Like anything that's going to make me shoot more of a laser beam, I want. I right. want that opportunity. Right. Why? Why? Flatter, straighter. Why fight it? Right. Why? Well, why fight that? Why give up an advantage? Mm-hmm. Right. right. Yeah. And you know, like, and the other thing that that tells me the if it's don't broke don't you know if it's not broke don't fix it line is you know there's other people supporting that sort of theory is you know like aaron cowan himself he's been a 3.25 moa rmr dot guy forever Mm -hmm. he's just recently switching to the one moa dots oh no kidding yeah and you know he's um playing around with those you know and and being a proponent for those like things are working differently you know you really need to give things a try before making you know passing judgment really i I agree different things work for different folks and different hand size different eyes different ears you know everything is different or none of us are the same i agree and honestly i'll say i'll add to that what works for you today may but that may not be what works for you tomorrow and may not be what worked for you 10 years ago right um that's kind of proving to be the case for me and you know it's, it's it's really weird um it's just, I don't know. It's kind of humbling. You know I mean? I had to, I had to put a lot of ego aside when I, when I kind of went through it the other day and, and like, you know, I went to the range and, and, you know, about 200 rounds into my 800 round segment, I was like, wow, I really suck with this gun for some reason today. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, I don't, I don't get it. I mean, I know this gun like the back of my hand. I, I, you know, I've said before, I can, I can shoot a Glock 19. Like I'm pointing my finger at things. I don't have to think about that. And the only difference was um i put that hollow sun on it and 
you know, that was no, and, and I undercut the trigger guard. And I was like, it can't be the hollow sun. And I think really what I was seeing was the difference between that, the smaller dot was making my instability, the instability of my grip more noticeable. A bigger dot obscures that. You don't see the movement as much. Yeah, I, I took two guns with me. I took my Gen 4 gun, you know, aka Space Glock, which I got to figure out a better name for it than that. Um, you know, and I picked it up with the six, six, mil, uh, six MOA dot, and I, I leveled it out the target. And from more than nine yards away, I was able to hit a one-inch target and just blast the center of it. I mean, like overlap three, three rounds, 115 grains, round, you know, hollow, uh, full mud jacket. Target ammo just overlapped them, cloverleaf them effortlessly. And I was like, huh, well, I mean, it's not me. I'm not, I'm not like right. having a bad day. I'm not sucking here. You know? And so, yeah, I took the, the Gen 5, leveled it up, and it's like, wow, it is, there's something going on. Like, I mean, for some reason, I cannot, I cannot stabilize this gun. I was like, well, is it the weight of the, the weapon light? So I threw the X300, the Surefire X300 UA on the Gen 5 gun. Is it the weight? No, it's not that, you know, and the only thing I couldn't really do was throw the, you know, the Zev slide on the Gen 4. I mean, they, that, that's not going to work, right? Because Gen 5, Gen 4. And the only thing I could really come up with is the amount of um, plyometric force that I was able to apply because of the trigger guard and undercut. So, like I said, I cammed my wrist forward a little bit more. I shoved more hand up into it and it stabilized. And once again, I was knocking the center out of the, of the one inch target with the gen five and i was like okay i've screwed this gun up by you know trying to eke out just a little bit more whatever and i pushed it too far and i should have left well enough alone so it's kind of an expensive lesson to learn when you think about you know the cost of a of a frame is you know 200 bucks and now the serial numbers of the slide and the frame aren't going to match so you know way to go david but whatever you know i'm not planning on getting rid of that gun anyway so right live and learn So there you go. Yeah, I, I think that the uh, trying new things is key. Yeah, I mean, it I is. think that not not necessarily to the point where it's messing you up. Like try so many things all the time that you're still not working on your fundamentals with your go to. Sure. You know what I mean? Like you, I, I still think that you, that needs to be a priority. But then when 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 you're trying something new and you have that light bulb moment. Yeah, that's when you know maybe start diverting some focus. Like, yeah. well, I shoot really good with this arm. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, I shoot really good with an RDS, a red dot sight. Yeah, man, my follow up shots are a lot cleaner with a comp. You yeah. know, like you start learning these things, and man, I can really change mags a lot quicker with a little bit of a mag flare, mag well on the bottom of my exactly, vest. exactly. Um, or, or this holster design works really well for me. I should, I should build my carry gear right around. out of my mouth. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it, it absolutely is. I think a lot of times we kind of chase what's cool and happening now. I'm gonna say on social media, you know, we see a we see a thing, and it's like, man, that looks good on Instagram, and we kind of start to build our 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 thing or our our, our carry gear around it, and maybe that looked great you know, to us and it worked great for that person, but it may not work great for us. You know, mm -hmm. it's amazing. You know, I, I used to carry M and P's a lot and, and they work for me. They, they fit my hand well. And, um, I, I did take the, the, you know, the M and P full size out and I ran it with, <laughs> I took my M and P compact slide that's milled for an RMR and I threw it on my full size frame, you know, both 2.0, 2.0 slide two you know, 2.0 frame, compact slide, compact, uh, full size frame. They work together famously. It's like a 2.0 Glock 45, if that makes sense. They were they were great. Um, if anything, it kind of prompted me to think about maybe sending my full size slide out to have it milled or something. But I don't know. Some other day, I uh, took it, ran it, and you know, it's kind of funny. I don't know. I, I guess somehow the RMR that was on that gun ended up back up on that gun because I thought I'm gonna have to sight this one back in. I took it out, pulled the first shot. Bullseye, hmm. yeah. yeah. Backed up, you know, a little bit further. Pulled the shot. Bullseye, huh? Backed up, three shots. Knocked the center. I was like, well, hell, I'm not going to adjust this. It's dead on. Must have somehow I ended up with the same sight back on it. <clears throat> so 
yeah, I ran into, you know, like 50 rounds. I was like, oh man, I kind of forgot why I like this gun. You know, even for its mushy factory trigger, mm-hmm. it's a pretty good gun. And um, I don't hate them. So, you know, for there you go, audience members that think we're just Glock fanboys. I, I kind of like it. And then, of course, I took the 509 and I freaking love this 509. I know it's not, you know, like you've asked me, what's it do better than a Glock 19? Nothing. It doesn't do anything better than a Glock 19. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> But I love this gun. It's 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 uh it 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 man effortlessly knocks the center out of that that bullseye at nine, ten, seven, you know, nine, ten, fifteen yards or so. Um especially with that apex trigger on there. That is a that is such a sweet shooter. <laughs> it's a shame that you know they've got a bad rap for the strikers breaking, but you know, the, I've got the apex heavy duty striker in there now and the apex trigger and it's it's good to go. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's a good gun. I like it. It's it, it's growing on me, but yeah, yeah. I've got a class coming up with Mike Sassino in a few weeks. See ya. Uh, three day pad, a class, one day carbine, two day pistol. Yeah, and I'm really struggling as to what cl- gun I'm going to run in this class. And I'm teetering on the Glock 45 that I just built. Yeah, with comp, which has been my carry gun because I'm aces with it, and it's basically a Glock 17. You know what I mean? It's, well, it's I would do. Yeah. But I really want to run the Zev. I really want to run the Ozone. I was going to ask you about the Zev. That gun is yeah. buttery nice. So I'm tempted. I mean, I've got, I've got, I've got this money burning a hole in my pocket. Uh, I'm tempted about the OZ9 compacts. We may mm-hmm. talk about that. I'm really tempted about it. Um, I was going to ask about the OZ9, the full size, like. I mean, they know, I kind of like, they, they've advertised that as like a competition gun. I mean, it's a race gun. I mean, it, it's, but people are carrying them too, right? So, I mean, mm-hmm. I don't know. But the compact, definitely they've aimed that at the carry market. That is, yeah. I mean, I, God, I'm tempted. You're going to have them in stock yeah. tomorrow? Yeah, they're arriving tomorrow. <clears throat> oh, man. You know, I want one. This is terrible. Yeah. This is terrible. All right, so we may have to talk about that on a future show. Yep. The yep. Wizard of OZ9 has yep. struck. I know, right? I mean, I knew it as soon as I held that thing in my hand at NRAM that, like, even even Sandy, even my wife said, that's a nice gun. I, like, I think that she would, even though she didn't completely threaten, like, to just kick my butt over the staccato, mm-hmm. the, 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 the OZ9 would probably be welcomed in the house the staccato would have been tolerated even Corey, yeah you know the other day like i did a trigger job and something he's like yeah that's nice he's like man that oz9 is nice trigger trigger i mean it's just and especially after i got you know i think i probably have a little up probably i don't know a little less than two thousand rounds through at this point and uh i mean the first i think it was like the first 1350 were in three days right i put some put some serious lead through that thing real quick but it's just gotten better you know things have gotten, I get it. gotten smoother hey, their, their it's triggers gotten their drop-in triggers the glocks are are money they're nice like the one in my gen 9 or my gen 5 beautiful trigger people have shot at the range and they're like wow that's really nice but the one in the oz9 somehow it's better i mean they say it's the same trigger but it's better well, it's, it's because it's because it's in that it's chassis i guess fit into a chassis that's all steel yeah so all the flex and you're getting more of the uh, tank, the click God, Mark, the plastic i'm calling you tomorrow with a credit card this is what's happening i mean <laughs> this is what's gonna happen it's gonna uh, you know all right so like it would it would be shipped to you and then Corey can make me a holster right hmm. yeah well, that's easy yeah. yeah okay all right this is gonna happen all right so the other thing that i'm really dying in, and i know you don't have any information on this is i i need i need streamlight's gotta hurry up on this new tlr7 that's gotta happen yeah. that, that that's gotta with my short thumbs, I got these that or I need to get thumb extensions. One of the two. The you know, <clears throat> oh well. All right. Anything else we want to talk to these folks about while we got their attention or are no, they still awake? I don't know. It's like, are you awake out there? All right. Tap on the mic, wake I'm people up. Fast. All right. Uh, I'm fading fast too. But we got to we're gonna do another we're gonna record again this week. We are. So. Yeah, we're gonna do a marathon. I think the next episode, yeah. which is probably the, I, I have no idea. Like I said, time travel, they may hear the next one first. Who knows? Um mm-hmm. 
kind of feeling like there's a lot of stuff going on right now in the in the in the firearms world. Um, people lose their minds about things, so we may talk about that, and it may air first. But anyway, yeah, all right. So, um, how do folks connect with you after the show to take advantage of all the good stuff that? Squared Away Customs has, and if they just want to bug you and send you memes and things. Yeah, uh, so you can go to squaredawaycustoms.com, use coupon code SHOOTERSNATION, and save yourself a little bit of money on some holster gear. Yep. And if you just want to have questions, drop show notes, uh, you know, whatever you want to do, yep. chat, um, you can reach me at marketshootersnation.com. Absolutely, yep. Send us ideas. Tell us what you want us to talk about. Shooters Nation, do that, marketshootersnation.com. So, audience, if you want to connect with us, shootersnation.com. Facebook dot com slash shooters nation instagram shooters nation radio that seems like ostentatious like we had these brand ideas maybe one of these days we'll be on the radio we'll see you can reach me by email as david at shooters nation.com and if you're again in the market for new hosters firearms gear all that other cool stuff squarewaycustoms.com use that coupon code shooters nation that's it for this episode yep what what, oh, what am I doing? one more thing. People <laughs> should uh, start paying attention because we may have a new sponsor jumping in soon. We might. That's right. I need to circle back with that poor guy. I, I've kind of put him on hold and I apologize to him because of like Hurricane Dorian wrecked my world this past week. So he's mm-hmm. been very patient, but I'm, I'm excited about that. That's that's going to be good. That's that's one of those things that much like holsters and gear from Swerto Customs, this is one of those things that if you've got a gun yeah. and you got a holster, you need this too. You should have this. It's kind of like these things all go together. I like it. Stay tuned. Stay tuned on that. All right, folks. That's it for this episode. We'll talk to you again in a week. Until then, maybe a week. I don't know. We're kind of like on this every other week schedule. I don't know. I kind of apologize for that. It's loosey goosey lately. It's complicated. All right. Until then, get trained. Carry a tourniquet. Be hard to kill. Carry your gun. Every day, carry your gun. Be dangerous. Talk to you soon. Seating segment was a production of the Shooters Nation podcast. Visit us online at shootersnation.com.